A new hope. Wow, what a fantastic day. You know, we have been going, as for those of you that don't know and, and haven't been here for a long time, at New Hope, we just kind of go systematically through the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, in expository fashion. And we've come to a section of Scripture now, we're in, we're in Luke chapter 21. And it's a wonderful passage, if you'd open your Bibles there. Luke chapter 21, where Jesus is going to be dealing with the end times, things that are going to be happening in the future. In our context, Jesus has entered Jerusalem on Monday. He cleanses the temple on Tuesday. He teaches on Wednesday. And now we see him in the evening. He's leaving. He's leaving the temple. And as he's leaving the temple, uh, going up, uh, he is with his disciples. And he's walking. And, and, and as they're walking by the temple, they, they say, Hey, Jesus, have you noticed this place? I mean, this is incredible. Look at the work. Look at, look at this temple, how amazing it is. And he says, not a stone is going to remain on another. And in the context of this, he then begins to receive questions from his disciples. When is this going to happen? How is this, this going to go down? And so he answers them first in our text how the temple will be destroyed. And we saw in uh, messages past how in 70 AD that happened. By the way, if you missed the last three or four messages, go watch them because they're all on the same section of Scripture. In 70 A.D., the temple was destroyed. And now they are asking questions about when will your second coming uh, be? What will the future be like? What does the future hold? And so Jesus will begin now to tell them what the future is like. And the reason that Jesus always wants us to know about the future is because he wants to give us hope. Hope is what it's all about. It's all about hope and something to hope in and something to hope for. And so that you and I will be a church waiting for our king. That's what we want to be. And so as we get into these, these kind of particular texts like Luke chapter 21, we see, we discover that there can be many different interpretations and throughout history there have been many different people who have interpreted this, these kind of texts in many different ways. And so we begin to think to ourselves, hmm, I wonder, is there a right way and a wrong way to interpret prophetic scripture? What is the right way to approach scripture and to interpret it so that we can get from it that which Jesus intended, the hope that he wanted us to have from this? So today, I know we've been, we've been really getting deep into this section of Luke chapter 21, verses 5 through, through 36, and we've been just really going verse by verse. Today, I just, even though we're in that section, I just want to take a, 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 just a brief step back and give you a little bit of a picture, a little bit of, of picture about God's people. See, because you and I need to have the ability, if we're going to know Revelation and what it's about and, and future, uh, uh, time, uh, future passages about the future, we're going to need to have an idea of, of how to put God's people in perspective. Because it's all about God's people and what, is, what God is doing through his people. So in order to have a good view, a healthy view, a biblical view, a sound view of the future, we need to also have a healthy view of God's people and put them in a healthy view perspective. Now, now, with that being said, I, I, I want to kind of, by way of introduction, give you, give you some basics here uh, uh, about this section and, and about interpretation in general. When you approach the Bible, when you approach the Bible, unless the text is an allegorical text or unless the text warrants that some different meaning be given to it or some figure of speech is being used, Unless that is the case, we take the literal interpretation of the text, as literal as it can be. And sometimes, even allegories have things that are literal that they point to. And so that is the position that we want to take when we approach the Scripture. We believe that God's Word is trustworthy. We believe that God is not a God of confusion, but a God of order and a God of peace. And He, wants, he wrote these things because He wants us to understand them, not because He wants to confuse us. So... We have to remember that he is speaking, Jesus, to his disciples. Many of whom were not terribly educated people. These, these are not, these are not uh, theologians who have received their terminal degree. I mean, these are, these are, these are fishermen. 
These are tradesmen. These are just basic folks. And he's speaking to basic folks in basic language about what's going to happen in the future. They were Jews. And so they understood a little bit of the history of Israel and, and what, what the Jewish people were all about. And so it will help us tremendously today if we just take a little bit of a step back and talk about God's people in perspective. And that begins with Israel and will lead up to us today. Okay, that's the, the route we're going to go. We'll start with Israel and then we'll see how do we relate to Israel and how does all that work and, and, and what ramifications does that have for the future. Now, the study of end time events or future events because theologians like to make themselves start, sound smart. They call that eschatology. Eschatology is just a fancy word for what's going to happen in the future. Okay? So the interesting thing is that there are many views of eschatology. Many people can read the same passage and walk away with two different interpretations. But I want to tell you that it's not because the verse is difficult or intended to be so. It is because we approach the text with certain presuppositions, with certain things in our head. And so we approach the text sometimes wrongly. And if our premise is wrong, our conclusion is going to be wrong. So it helps to get an accurate premise down first. It will help us tremendously when we're trying to do that to understand three things, just three things about biblical prophecy. Any view you take, and, and by the way, I'm not here to push my view on you. I have a particular view of, of, of the end times. We don't have to agree on that. I'll tell you what my view is if you want to know. But we don't have to agree on that. We don't have to agree on that. What we do have to agree on, however, is that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And that's a wonderful hope, no matter what your view of the future is. But with that being said, I want to give you just a few tools that might help you in your own personal discovery of what the future is all about. There are three basic things that you need to keep in mind whenever you're putting together your formulation in your head of what you think the, the Bible says about the future. I want you to keep three things in mind. One, the promises of God in the Old Testament must be fulfilled. They must. So if you have a, a, a view of the future that doesn't include the fulfillment of God's promises, red flag, you got a problem there. Okay? Next. So his, all of his promises from the Old Testament must be fulfilled. Next requirement. Whatever your view of the future is, however you put together uh, eschatology in your head based on Scripture, it also must take into consideration the fact that all the promises in the New Testament will come true. All of God's promises in the New Testament will come true. If you have a view of the future where you think God's promises in the New Testament won't come true, you can just pitch it. Okay? Thirdly and lastly... Thirdly and lastly, these are like the, the core essentials, okay? Thirdly, whatever view of the future you want to take, whatever side of the ball you, 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 want, to, you want to be on, you've got to, you've got to understand that the, uh, the coming of Jesus, the coming of Jesus will be at a day and a time and an hour where we do not know. Anybody that tells you they know the day and the hour, right? Wrong view of eschatology. It will be at a time we do not know, and it will be imminent. means it, it can happen at any moment. Jesus can come. The disciples in the first century were waiting for him. They, they, they thought like he could come today. They weren't like waiting for something. They weren't like, oh, that's not going to happen for 300 years or 1,000 years. They were like, he could come today. You, got, you better be ready. So any view of eschatology you want to go ahead and, and take up, just make, make sure that your view includes that the promises of the Old Testament must come true, the promises of the New Testament must come true, and that Jesus is coming at an hour when we do not expect, and his, hour, his coming is imminent, which means it can happen right now. Now, as long as you keep those three and keep it biblical, the rest doesn't so much matter. We can disagree on little things here and there. It's not a big deal, okay? So I just want to give you those tools as, as, a, as a primer, and now we'll move from there. Let's begin by talking about God's people, God's possession, what he called his possession in the Old Testament. That was the nation of Israel, and God had a purpose for his possession. God had a purpose for his possession. Why did God choose Israel, and how was Israel intended to be used by God? That's a good question for us to, to, to ponder. We should know about Israel and who, who they were and what they were all about, why God chose them. Psalm chapter 135 verse 4 says this. 
For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself and Israel as his, catch the word, own possession. Okay? Israel is his own possession. God chose Israel as an example of, of how he would deal with the problem of human sin eventually. God had chosen Israel for his own special possession. And he gave them special promises. He gave them special spiritual promises. And he gave them special physical promises. Okay? They are his own possession. Deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 22 says this. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. And the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of of the earth. Why did God choose Israel specifically, the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, Jacob? Like, I don't know. I don't know why God did that. It wasn't because they were any kind of special or anything, because God usually picks the most messed up people to do the most wonderful things through, because he gets all the glory that way. So these probably messed up people. And so he did some great things through them. But nonetheless, whatever the reasons are, God had to choose somebody, so he chose Jacob. He chose the nation of Israel to create the nation of Israel through him and he promised him. He promised him that he would do certain things. Now, Isaiah 43, 31, or 43, 1 rather, says, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. And then the text goes on to describe the great nation that would come from it. And in Genesis 17, 7, we have kind of a, a revelation of the heart of the covenant that God made with Israel. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for, and catch this, an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. The covenant's everlasting. So Israel was God's chosen people, and he was their God. God says that he chose Israel and made them his own possession. Why did God choose Israel? Why did God give them unique privileges and unique responsibilities? Isaiah chapter 49, 3. And he said to me, you are my servant Israel, in whom, check it, I will be glorified. That's the purpose right there. I will be glorified. By the way, guys, if you're ever wondering what is the greatest, most awesome thing you could ever do with your life, the highest chief end of man, it is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's what it's all about from him, through him, and to him are all things. And there's nothing you could ever do greater with your life than to see to it that God receives the glory that he is due. Now, Israel was chosen for that purpose. Those people were chosen for that pur purpose. So that God would be glorified, to receive glory and praise by what he did through the people. Not that the people would be fantastic, but that through their weakness, he would show forth his glory. So Israel had a purpose, a destiny, to be chosen, to be holy, to be set apart, to be redeemed, to be called, to be reconciled with God, to be in a unique covenant relationship with God as an example to the heathen nations around them. To bring him glory through and through which, of course, Messiah would eventually come. Jesus came through that lineage, the Jewish lineage. So what became of Israel? What happened to this wonderful purpose that God had for his possession? Well, Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 1, verse 11 rather, says this. Jeremiah 13, 11 says this. I made the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that I may, might be, that they might be for me a people, a name, and priests, and a glory, a praise, and a glory, but they would not listen. That's the key right there. The, the end is, they would not listen. So God had these wonderful plans for them, but they would not listen. It would have been great if they went along with his plan. Was God taken surpri uh, surprised by this? No. He wasn't taken aback by it. He knew what would happen. Doesn't mean he wanted it to happen, just means he knew what would happen, and so he had a plan. There's never a plan B with God, there's always a plan A, because he always knows what's going to happen. But they would not listen to what he wanted them to do. Why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about Israel and what the history was and what God created them for and what was the whole deal? Here's why. I'm going to tell you something, you may not know this. How you understand, how you understand Israel and God's plan for Israel and God's promises for Israel 
will completely determine how you interpret prophecy in the Bible. It'll, inter it'll determine how you interpret all the rest of prophecy. So this is why we're talking about it. This is why it's so important to understand the purpose God had for his possession. We also need to understand the progress of God's plan. The progress of God's plan. Remember we said they wouldn't listen? So here's the progress of God's plan. Never a plan B, always a plan A. But here's the progress of God's plan. He did something in the New Testament. He did something through us. He changed something. He revealed something. It was probably a better way of putting it. That was always on his mind. He revealed something that, that we didn't quite see clearly. Romans chapter 9, verse 4 through 5 says this. They, that's referring to Israel, are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, to the Jews, belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to their flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So what came of Israel's disobedience and rejection of God that we saw in our previous text. Well, this, Romans chapter 9, verse 6 through 8. But it is not as though the word of God had failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all who are children of Abraham, that means blood children of Abraham, because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Catch that? Paul here is saying that all those who would come to God by faith would be considered children of promise. Those who come by faith are part of spiritual Israel. They receive spirit, uh, spiritual Israel. They receive Israel's spiritual blessings. Salvation, justification, being made right with God, salvation. Eternity with Him. See, the state of Israel... The time when Jesus came, when Jesus came, he, he, he uh, uh, approached Jerusalem. He approached Jerusalem, and he was heartsick over what he saw. He was heartsick over what he saw. And by the way, the proof, you know, we just talked about the fact that to be part of that, you have to come by faith, not just what your, what your bloodline is, but you, you come by faith. You know how, you know how, you know if those people were part of true Israel? When Jesus the Messiah came, the proof that whether one was part of true Israel was whether or not he accepted Jesus as the Messiah or denied him. Most Jews denied him. Most Jews denied him. But those that did not remained part of Israel. And those outside of Israel that accepted him, became part of Israel. John says, no one who denies the Father has the Son. He who confesses the Son has the Father. First John chapter 2. Jesus said, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father, and the Father who sent him, John 5, 23. So these people thought, well, we've got God the Father, we have Abraham as our Father, and we know God, and, and all this stuff. And, and Jesus is like, hey... <laughs> If you don't know me, if you don't accept me, then you don't know the Father. You're not part of Israel. I don't care what your bloodline is. I don't care what your DNA is, physically. You're not part of Israel. And by the way, speaking to all non-Jewish people, here's what Paul says. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, Paul says this. Remember... Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise. You were strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, no hope and without God in the world. That was the condition that we find ourselves in prior to Christ. That's where we were. But then Jesus comes on the scene and everything changes. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are now fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6 says, This mystery is that the Gentiles are now fellow heirs. See, this was a mystery. 
This, this was a, a mystery means something that is shrouded until it is revealed. This was a mystery. The mystery that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus. How? Through the gospel. Through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Through his finished work. Paul is, here is describing the church and all who put their faith in Christ. We were once separated from Christ, but now Christ has drawn us near to himself. So the two are made one, if you will. Now, now that we understand a little bit of the purpose of God's possession and the progress of God's plan, I want to end with this. Our perception of God's promises. Our perception of God's promises. This is probably the kicker here. See, our interpretation of God's promises has a profound impact on our understanding of future events. Now, certainly, certainly, God's spiritual promises are seen to be fulfilled. The Messiah came, did just what he said he would do. And they are filled to all who belong to him, not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles as well, if they would believe in Christ. Whether Jew or Gentile, all will receive the promise of salvation through the Messiah. So God's spiritual promises to Israel are fulfilled. But, but, yes, his spiritual promises to Israel are fulfilled. Yes, we are made part of Israel. Yes, we're grafted in, but. God also made physical promises to Israel that have not yet come true. And God always keeps his word. Always. He didn't forget. He didn't forget. Now, I want to give you a little bit of a caveat here before I go on. I have my own personal beliefs about end times. I'm not forcing those opinions on you. I just want whatever your opinion is to be sound and to be biblical. Okay? We don't have to agree on the details. So what I personally believe isn't that, that important. But I do believe that Scripture clearly teaches that God will fulfill His promises. And so we have to ask, what is He going to be doing with Israel? What promises to Israel that God Himself made that are not yet fulfilled, that must be fulfilled in the future? Because God always keeps His promises. See, God will, at some point, come to reign and to rule. He is called the King of Israel, the Messiah is. He is King over Israel. He will reign on a physical throne in Israel, in Jerusalem. So we are God's people sharing in the spiritual blessings given to Israel. But I want you to notice a couple of passages here. Just a couple of passages. I think I'll share five of them with you. Genesis chapter 13. By the way, there's hundreds of passages on this same subject. I just picked five. Because, you know, I figured you've only got like four hours today. So, right. Genesis 13, 14 says, And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you can see, I will give you. And to your offspring forever. You see the promise? Far as you can see, north, south, east, and west. You say, well, that's good. It's a long way, but it seems kind of vague. I mean, I guess that could refer to anything, right? Genesis 15, 17 through 18. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your offspring, I give this land from the river Egypt to the great river, to the river Euphrates. Now, that's getting pretty specific. That's some serious geographical description there. Okay, so this isn't just pie in the sky. Isaiah chapter 60, verses 21 through 22. Your people shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever. They shall possess the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. Again, that I may be glorified. There's the theme. The least one shall become like a clan, and the smallest one like a mighty nation. I am the Lord... In its time, I will hasten it. In other words, I will bring it about. I will bring it about. You don't have to do anything to bring it I'll, I'll bring it about. Nothing you got to do. I'll bring it about. Don't worry. 
Last passage on this. Jeremiah 32, 37 through 41. Behold, I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them. So the Lord scattered Israel, scattered the Jews to all different nations. I will draw them. I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them. And in my, in my anger and my wrath and in my great indignation, that's what God did as a punishment. He drove them out. But I will bring them back to where? To this place. And I will make them dwell in safety. And they shall be my people. And I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them, I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing good to them and I will plant them in the land in faithfulness with all my heart and my soul. Wow, when God says something like that, you kind of perk up and listen and go, wow, he must be serious about this thing. Forever. I will never leave them. I will always bless them. They'll possess all of the land and they'll possess it forever. Forever means as long as the sun is still uh, up there and the, the earth is rotating around it and an earth still exists, that thing will, will exist when it comes to, to pass. Now I want you to notice this. Don't miss this. Just as surely as God kept his spiritual promises and blessings through Christ's first coming, in the same way he will also keep his physical promises in his second coming. Just as he kept all of his spiritual promises in his first coming, he will also not fail to keep all of his physical promises in his second coming. It is important long about this time to try to get an accurate understanding of what our relationship is to Israel as the church. Because there's many different views on this. I mean, are we like, did, did the church like replace Israel? Or are we one with Israel? Or, or, or how does that work? Is, is there a sense in which in some ways we're Israel, but in some ways we're not? Like, what does this all look like? How did, how did this all come about, and, and, and where do we find ourselves? I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 11 for a moment. Grab your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 11, uh, verse 17. We'll start there. Romans eleven seventeen, if you would. Fascinating passage. Gives much, much insight into the relationship between us and and Israel. What happened to Israel? Where are they now? How do they fit? What's going to happen with their future? Romans eleven seventeen through 26. It says this. But if some of the branches were broken off, this is speaking of God's olive tree and how Israel is the branches of this, this great olive tree of God. If some of those branches were broken off and you, the Gentiles, although you were an a wild olive shoot, were taken and grafted in among those others, and now share in the nourishing root of that olive tree, do not become arrogant toward the original branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who, are support, who supported the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, well, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Well, that's true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through your faith. So do not become proud, but rather fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Remember, it's children of Abraham by faith, right? If we don't have faith, we're cut off. And even they, now catch this, this is really key right here. Don't lose me here. Verse 23, Romans chapter 11, verse 23. And even they, the original Jews, original Israel, even, and even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, remember they rejected the Messiah, so they there was unbelief. If they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted back in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut 
from what is by nature a wild olive, wild olive tree, you Gentiles, and contrary to nature, into a cultivated, grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural, original branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. Here's the, here's the mystery. Ready for it? Here's the mystery. A partial hardening has come upon Israel, like a hardening of their heart. A partial hardening has come upon Israel. That's why they rejected the Messiah. Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. That means until every Gentile is saved. And in this way, in this way, all Israel will be saved. Fascinating passage, isn't it? You go, wow, that's some insight. Last passage for this morning is this one. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. Matthew 23, 37 through 39. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. This is Jesus, by the way. Walking up to Jerusalem just before the triumphal entries, looking over Jerusalem. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who have been sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again. You will not, listen, you will not see me again. Israel, Jerusalem will never see Jesus again until they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, you've got to understand this. Remember we just read this passage about that they can be grafted in again. A partial hardening has happened until the fullness of the Gentiles. You know what's going to happen? When the last Gentile is saved, there will come a time when Jews will recognize that they missed their Messiah, that Jesus really is their Messiah, and they will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and then Jesus will return to rule and to reign from a physical throne in Israel. Every single land promise that was given will be fulfilled completely, utterly, literally, because God does not fail to keep his promises. Now, Someday, I think not too long from now, quite honestly. Now, we're not going to get into times and whatever, and I'm not going to tell you when I think Jesus has come, because if I did, it wouldn't happen anyway, because nobody knows, right? But, for what it's worth, I think we're very close to this. I mean, like, very, very close. Very close. Someday the people of Israel will be gathered together, will recognize Jesus as their Messiah, and they will declare, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, then Jesus will reign. See, Israel right now, Jerusalem right now, is still under this curse that happened. They rejected him. Partial hardening took place. They rejected the Messiah. 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. They're still under that same curse. They're surrounded. Go, go watch a couple of sermons back. We talked about this. They're surrounded by enemies on every side who are bent, whose purpose is to destroy them. They're still under that curse. <laughs> They're still under that curse. But a time will come, not long from now, I believe, when they will recognize their Messiah. They were scattered all over the earth. Remember our scripture talks about that? For the first time in a very, very, very long time, in 1948, they got their land back. They got Israel back. These, these are the events of history, folks. This is why we're given prophecy. Do you know that? So that we can look at the events of history, compare it to prophecy, and go, hmm, that's interesting. They were returned back to their land three years after... Three years after, one-third of the Jewish population of the earth was destroyed in an attempted genocide. Three years later, just three years later, after they were almost wiped out, after an attempt was made to wipe them out, three years later, they got their land back. And there will come a time, I believe, possibly even in my lifetime, when this will all happen. And Jesus will return. 
But know this. I personally believe that that doesn't have to happen before Jesus will come and take up his church. That's what I believe. I believe scripture teaches that. You don't have to believe that. That's okay. You can believe that it'll happen some other way or whatever. But I believe scripture teaches that he will take up his church. It's called the taking up or the gathering up to meet him in the air. Scripture teaches that pretty clearly. And that we will meet him in the air. And that will be prior to his reigning and, and ruling for a thousand years. So, the point is this, folks. We're living in the end times. We have all of these things happening. We see it in the news. He's going to come, but he could come today. He could come right now. And some of you are like, man, I wish he'd come before this guy finished with the sermon. You know. <laughs> but he could come at any time. And that's the wonderful thing, guys. We're, listen, man, this morning we're singing about make us a church ready for you. You know what the problem is? We're going to go home. We're going to sing some cool song in a little bit. And then we're going to get in our cars. And we're going to drive away. And we're going to go home. And we're going to either go out to lunch. Or we're going to cook dinner. And we're going to get right back into our lives. And right back into the stuff that grips us and binds us. And makes us think that this is the only thing that's really real. Getting up, brushing our teeth, going to work, sucking air, doing it all over again. And the point is, folks... That these kind of prophecies are supposed to inspire us. They're supposed to help us think outside the box and beyond this life. Something more, something different, something better. To live for, not just now. To lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust does not corrupt and where thieves do not break in and steal. To, to, to set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. To not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. To seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he'll take care of your rent. That kind of stuff. See, this stuff ought to encourage us. As we're going through life. Because life is more about, more than just life. Or what we perceive as life here and now. And we're too busy... Messing around with what we can see, hear, smell, taste, touch. That we lose sight of what's real reality. Because it takes so long. You know, we're here to celebrate a thing called life. And often, we get lost in that. We get lost in celebrating life. And so don't let that consume you. Don't let your worries consume you. Think about what's more. Think about what's beyond this life. Because there's something else. The afterworld. A world of never-ending happiness. You can always see the sun, day or night. Yes, I am a Prince fan. Go look up that song. But that's the great part of it. It's not about this world. It's about the afterlife. Be encouraged, would you? Be encouraged by prophecy. Be encouraged by the things that will shortly take place. Be encouraged when you see the, the news. Be encouraged when you see what's happening in Israel. Be encouraged when you see wars and rumors of wars and things getting worse and worse. You know what happens when I see that things are getting worse and worse? I just smile because I say, man, it's just closer to Jesus coming. So you've got plenty to be encouraged about if you watch the news. And if you don't know Jesus, let me encourage you this morning. Let me encourage you. He wants you to be part of this thing. Thing that's happening, this kingdom that's coming, because he's coming and he's the king, and he wants you to be part of his kingdom. All you've got to do is accept him as your Lord and Savior. You say, I repent of my sins, I accept you as my Lord and Savior of my life. I want you to reign and to rule on the throne of my life. And then you can look forward to wonderful, wonderful things. Let's stop living for this world. Let's start living for this, because it's coming quickly. Father, thank you for encouraging us this morning through your word. Lord, your plan through the ages is indeed marvelous as we ponder it. 
And Lord, we just stand in awe at how you work through all the people of the Old Testament and all those circumstances and, and, and situations. You work through the centuries to redeem your people to yourself. Thank you for the salvation that's available to us through the sacrifice of Jesus. Thank you for adopting us as your own through him, for making us one with your chosen people through him. Lord, it's overwhelming when we consider that we're, we're part of your story, your story of redemption. And that when we read all the stories in the Old Testament about Moses and Elijah and Ezekiel and David, Lord, we're part of those stories because we're your people. We share in that. That's wonderful. It's so good to be part of the story too. Lord, we, we rejoice in the fact that you're coming soon. And, and we can't wait till the day you come back and you finally receive the glory that you've been robbed of for so long. We look forward to the day when the trumpet sounds and Jesus returns from the clouds with a shout of command, his face shining like the sun. And we rise to meet him in the air and then we will reign and rule with him forever. Lord, thank you for working these things out through the ages in your wisdom. Such a wonderful such a powerful plan. Thank you for making us a part of it. And thank you, Lord, for being our amazing, loving, wonderful God. May you come back quickly and find us faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.